Hey, good evening, everybody. Hi, my name is Todd Melby, and I'm the author of this book. This book is called A Lot Can Happen in the Middle of Nowhere, The Untold Story of the Making of Fargo. I'm Todd Melby. And with me tonight is Stephen Park from Los Angeles, California. Stephen, Hello. welcome. Hi, thank you, thank you. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Well, let me Excited introduce you here. Yeah, and I'll tell folks a little bit more about the book and a little bit more about the project, but since you're right there and, and we're looking at each other, let me give folks a little bit of your bio. Okay, great. Great. So in the movie Fargo, I'm sure you probably recognize his face, but in the movie Fargo, Stephen played Mike Yanagita, one of the most talked about scenes in the movie. And he's been in a lot of different movies and TV shows. So he was in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. He was in Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer. And if I remember correctly, you got that role just because of Fargo, right? Yeah, I was just actually remembering that. I remember director Bong introduced me to John Hurt. It's like, oh, this is Steve Park from Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> right. Uh, Steven's also in the upcoming Wes Anderson film. I believe that's called The French Dispatch. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. And then you've done a lot of TV work on uh, The Mindy Project, uh, Person of Interest, Friends. And I did also. another, uh, I did A Serious Man as well. That's right, of course. Yes, you were in serious. So you've been to Minnesota twice. Yeah, <laughs> Minneapolis, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Well, terrific. Um, let me do a couple more housekeeping items here and then uh, we can kind of dive in and talk more about the movie and more about the book. Uh, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Minnesota Historical Society Press. They are the publisher of this terrific book. And also the Trilon Cinema in Minneapolis. Uh, the Trilon Cinema is a nonprofit micro cinema. It's not really a micro cinema any, anymore, but I'm wearing a Trilon t-shirt because the Trilon is fantastic. Ah, nice. It Beautiful. is really nice. Yes. Uh, so the Trilon uh, is a nonprofit cinema. It's volunteer run and I'm one of the volunteers. So thank you, Trilon. And uh, why don't we just go ahead and dive right into the book? Um, yeah. I know, you know, Stephen, well, yeah, I mean, I'm actually curious, like, yeah. uh, like your research is so deep in this book. It's so impressive. Um, but you had no contact with the Coen brothers or France. You, did you, you didn't get their blessing or anything? Didn't, didn't get the blessing of Joel, Ethan or Francis, you know, uh -huh. reporters, we always like to talk to everybody, but not everybody is wants to either talk to us or they're too busy. You know, we also try, right. I also tried to talk to Roger Deakins and I kept, you know, he's the cinematographer, the director of photography on Fargo, done a lot of Coen Brother movies. And I kept trying to get Roger as well. And then and then I realized, oh, well, he was busy with 1917. So <laughs> he was Well, busy. you've got so much like secondhand, you know, information or, or uh, quotes from them. It almost seemed like you did interview them. I mean, it's really great. Terrific. Yeah. And I, and, and, and you're right. I think, you know, a lot, you know, people like you who, who worked with Frances were able to give me really good perspective on what she was like to work with as an actress. And of course, everybody had a Joel and Ethan story. So, right. yeah. <laughs> so um, maybe we could just talk about the book a little bit about, um, you know, since you've actually read the book yeah. recently within just the last few days, like as you were reading it, what was your, what was your experience? Well, just, well, reading it was just like all the things that I didn't know. I mean, I'm really excited to hear um, from Larissa and Melissa about their experiences uh, shooting their scenes and also about the nudity writer that showed up in their trailer. That I'm very curious to hear about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole story about the, um, the wood chipper is fascinating. Um, the, uh, I forgot his name who bought it. Yeah, um, Milo Durbin. Yes, and then uh, you know to actually use it for wood chipping, and then all of a sudden he started to get phone calls and realize, wait a minute, this this is actually more valuable than a wood chipper. And <laughs> exactly. uh, and when I went to Fargo in 2013 to the Fargo Film Festival, um, it has its own Facebook page. It had its own business. I'm talking about the wood chipper. Right. It has its own right. business card. Has its own uh, website. And uh, is sitting there, and I had my picture taken next to it. And it, you know, it has a Coen Brothers signature on it. And uh, yes, and also Wood Chip Marge. There's a huge statue of her in the Fargo movie theater. Um, so it's just amazing the impact it's had. And so uh, yeah, those kind of details were fascinating about the the, the Wood Chipper. So you just spoke to everybody. Uh, in the crew, like, how did you contact everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, and I, I'd be happy to answer that, but I think the one thing I forgot to say is that, yeah, we'll be joined um, 
in about uh, 15 minutes by um, Larissa Coconut and also by Melissa Peterman. And those were the actors that portrayed Hooker. Hooker no. <laughs> Larissa Coker no. Is that how she pronounces it? Yes. Okay. There was some yeah. debate before we went on. Um, but yeah, I think you were asking me how I how I did the research. And so what yeah. I did, I just, you know, called everybody who I who I wanted to talk to and looked them up on IMDB and just, you know, sent emails, made telephone calls, asked people who else I should talk to. Right. And what inspired you to write this book in the first place? Well, I'd never written a book before, number one. And I've well, also been your first book. Yes. Yes. Oh wow. Congratulations. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so well yeah. done. Yeah, and I also just like big projects. I mean, I'd done lots of audio documentaries with Diane Richard, my wife, who, who you know, you met via the phone when we interviewed you for the radio documentary that we also right. did on the movie Fargo. And right. I just, I just wanted to, you know, dig into a big project and learn more about movie making and and things I didn't know. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it that I think people kind of realize because I see all the names at the end of the screen, but they until you talk to a sound designer, you don't really know what a sound designer does or a, right. or a dolly grip, et cetera. Right, and, and so when this movie, and you're from that area, so when this, what does this movie mean to you? Like, how did it hit you? It, it, it hit me just fine. I mean, I was already living in Minneapolis. I wasn't offended by the accent. I think I was surprised <laughs> by the emphasis on the dialect and the accent. And, and I've suffered through so many of those blizzards and snowstorms. Yeah. Um, that you know, in researching this book, when I found out that that um, that Joel and Ethan and and everybody in the movie, um, somebody just walked by in the background there, so I was slightly distracted by somebody in your house who just kind of snuck oh, by by your fireplace. That's okay. <laughs> it was kind of entertaining. <laughs> yes, my wife just walked by. <laughs> it's one of those Zoom things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm in the kitchen, so uh, yeah, okay. So. Anyway, I yeah. think that that's the last uh, yeah. apparition you'll be seeing today. That's fine. Yeah, so anyway, I've lived through lots of blizzards, so the fact that there was no snow in Minnesota in 1995 when the brothers and all the actors and crew members were filming it was surprising. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. I don't even know. Um, so uh, you didn't speak to the Coen brothers, but you spoke to everybody else or to a lot of people, and so how long did this whole process take you? It took... Uh, Two or three intense years after yeah. after the radio documentary. So for the radio documentary, I'd inter you know I'd interviewed you and William H Macy and the dialect coach and a few other actors, um, but then it was just like kind of digging in and and going super super in depth. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that you know people don't really think about enough, I think, is you know when it when when it, when it comes to to movie making and once they see a movie that they like, they often focus on the actors or the director, but they don't often focus on the writing. And mm. I think as part of my research, like I spent lots of time reading Coen Brothers screen, screenplays. Like I read yeah. the first six screenplays, including the Fargo screenplay. Yeah. And, and of course, Joel and Ethan, they always set their screenplays in a very specific place. Mm. And for them, the accent or dialect is a way to get into that place and those, and those characters. Yeah. So I think when yeah. people like, Lots, some people in North Dakota are some a little bit nervous about the accent still that you know it's not that different than a than a well it you know, almost focus, seemed you know, like, I, yeah go ahead from what you were uh, from your book and just from different things I've heard it almost seemed like there was a delayed reaction to this movie like a lot of people were insulted especially in that area at first yes and people didn't know what to make of it it was like what is this what is this thing and then, then more and more people started to kind of realize that they really liked this movie. Like that's my impression. W would you say that? There was absolutely, kind of absolutely. I think you know the more successful the movie became, especially once it got Oscar nominated and had a couple of Oscar wins, and then became more of the, you know, yeah. Like we just we you know this is the first time anybody put a mirror up to Minnesota and North Dakota and made us right. look at ourselves, right? Right. right. <laughs> and so once we were forced to look at ourselves and acknowledge. Everything, yeah. then you know, we came to accept it more, right? Well, what I love about their writing is like when you read their screenplay, it really feels like you're watching the movie the way they write. It's not like exterior is such a play, blah blah blah. You know, when you read a screenplay, it's hard to picture it because there's so like reading the slug line and all, but the way they they um write the screenplay, and you mentioned this in the book, they use 
the these great adjectives, these great action verbs, you know. So there is this visceral feeling you have when you're reading it that it's like you're you're sitting in a movie theater almost. Like that's what it seems like. And also there's so specific about dialect and about speech patterns that that's all in there. So there's no need really to improvise and uh I found that really amazing about their writing. Yeah, right. And like, for example, I've, with your scene, I just rewatched it before uh, we came on the air. You know, um, you you use the phrase TV, but instead of saying TV, it's like TV. TV, yeah. 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 And then I found that that's true with a lot of the words in the, the Fargo strip. You know, groceries yeah. is G-R-O-W, like groceries, right. et cetera. Right. So what, what, why don't we talk? You know about 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 you and about your scene, and tell us the story of of you know how the script was passed to you and what your first reaction to it was. Well, when I first uh, read the breakdown, I I did pass on it at first because it uh, you know I'm like in my uh, early 30s and this character was in his 40s. He's overweight and balding, um, so just like fit. That's the kind of a issue sometimes for me as an actor. Like sometimes I get caught up with the physical description of an of a character, and if I don't meet it, then somehow I feel like I can't do this, or you know, and or even any kind of stage directions sometimes get in the way. So um, when my agent uh, or manager came back to me with the audition and encouraged me to audition for it, I had to kind of let all of that go and just kind of get into the the emotional life of the character. And I, I do remember I was. I flew into New York. It was, a, and I was. The audition was on a rainy Sunday morning, and I had this uh, kind of old blazer that I had, and I had a tie that had a stain on it. I remember, and I, I remember that helped me because that made me just feel more, you know, schluppy. You know. <laughs> so, did you purposely wear the tie with with the stain on? Oh it? yeah, I just was, you know, and it was like a wrinkled shirt, and it just, I just needed to feel like that. That was helping me uh, as I go went to this audition, but. It's still, you know, I was still struggling with feeling like I was reaching for this character. And, uh, but somehow during the audition, um, I was able to really get into the emotional life of the character. And I was able to, uh, I don't know, I just, I, I did feel after the audition, like, wow, I feel like I did really well. You know, there was that, that sense that I hit the emotional core that I, that I was trying to hit for the audition. And then so doing, doing the part, like I said, because the um, writing is so specific and the Coen brothers um, did not give me, you know, they didn't give me a lot of direction, but they didn't really need to because I, I felt like we both understood what the character was. So it really was about, um, you know, I was sitting with Fran, I, I think you mentioned this in the book as well. Like I remember the, they started with the camera on her, but I was already emotionally in it. And then, she, you know, after a few takes on her, she goes, you guys should turn the camera around. So. <laughs> Right, you know, then they turned it around and then it was really um, just about finding nuances, finding little moments like, uh, you know, when um, towards the end, when I, uh, she's saying, oh, I really like you too. And it's like, I like you so much, Marge. Like I jump, I jump on her line and, uh, you know, and the Coen brothers really like that, you know? So it's like finding those kind of ryth rhythmic moments were, were part of the process. And, and you know, they were, so um, relaxed and, and really great to work with. And, and I really appreciate when I, I know a director has a very specific vision of what they're going for, because then I know that when I've, if I've hit it or not. And I feel that with, with really, really great directors, I, 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 you know, they're not gonna let you get by with something that they're not happy with. So when you make them happy, it's so, it's so gratifying because you know that you hit their vision, you know, you, 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 uh, you rose to the occasion, you know. As an actor, is it easier for you to, to hit it if the writing's terrific? Oh yeah, absolutely. If the writing is not there, then it's not, it's very unlikely that uh, it'll show up on the screen. I, I feel that way. I feel like it, it has to be on the page first, unless, unless it's an improvisational project, you know. I mean, Spike Lee works kind of that way. He's very more lets the actors improvise. Like that was the case a lot on Do the Right Thing. I, there was a lot of that kind of just kind of open. The, the script was more of a skeleton, you know. So. And did you, well, since you mentioned Do the Right Thing, I have to ask you, did you imp improvise any of that scene with, uh, I, was it was it Bill Nunn who played Radio Rahim? 
Yes. Uh, that scene, uh, yeah, towards, we should, you know, we, towards we should, the end, we, it's like, come on, man. You know, he's rushing me. That's all improvised. He can't, Spike is just letting the camera run. So, you know, he was coming up with different lines and stuff. And so we were doing different takes of him, just like watching me fill the bag with the D batteries, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, the line uh, when the, the mob is coming towards the store and I'm swinging the broom um, and I'm right. saying, I know white, I know white. I black, I'm black, and then I say, you and me same, that line, you and me same, I improvised. And so Spike kept that in there. So like that kind of thing I thought was really great because uh, it was important for me to um, express the, the solidarity that uh, my character in that movie felt with the community. So that was the reason for that. Right, so at that point, the crowd didn't exactly buy it though, right? No. <laughs> but they didn't. They didn't burn burn the store down. So that was nice. That's true. Right. That nice yeah. That movie was so so far ahead of its time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you know the fact that it resonates now more than ever. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> back back to Fargo, um, and and your scene specifically, I believe they gave you the whole script so that you could learn that that your character was lying to Marge, right? Because it's not until later that we yes. realized that, yeah. Yeah, um, although I didn't, when I did the scene, I wasn't really concerning myself much with those kind of, like I was more um, in the pain of my character. And uh, it's funny because I, I read a lot of, the, the things that I've read about Mikey Anagita, you know, he's always described as this pathetic loser and I was like, God, people are so harsh, you know. It's like, you know, I have so much more, it just, you know, I mean, of course, I played him, but I just have a little bit more compassion for him than, you know. I just think he was a very, um, uh, you know, a lot of just lonely, desperate human being, you know. And, right. And, uh, that's, and, that, and that, but actors have to do that, I would guess. They have to, yeah, like, yeah identify yeah. with her, the character so I just, they're portraying. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I felt the, a lot and of the, compassion. Right. I just wanted to say that the photos that we're seeing now are photos that you provided to me that are also right. included in the book. So these are photos of, of right, you. That's right after I shaved my, or they shaved my hairline up a little bit there. So maybe an inch up. And um, what else? Um, I do know that the, um, the costume designer, uh, Mary Zofries, hired a local seamstress to make uh, Frances McDormand's uh, dress here. In, for this scene, yeah, and we both had. She had it, her pat. She had her padded belly. She did. I, I had a padded belly as well. So when we hugged, there was a little bit of like boing, you know, a little <laughs> boing action happening. Exactly. Yeah, because uh, yeah. So McDormand is wearing a birdseed onesie throughout right. the, the entire suit to sort of simulate pregnancy. That was such and a I, fascinating detail in your book about the birdseed. You know, you gave it a weight. Yeah, yeah. That way she was not just you know looking heavy she probably also felt heavy yeah yeah definitely. and uh also like you know you mentioned in the book that after it, the movie came out and i get a phone call from ethan saying oh everybody thought it was so funny or my scene and i was i was shocked when i first heard that because i had no idea that it was even meant to be funny and that was just because i was like kind of totally looking at it through the perspective of my character you know so mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, yeah, it was just pain and misery on my end. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, we're playing it at the at the trialon on Wednesday night. Um, so the seven o'clock show at the trialon is sold out, but there's still tickets left for the nine thirty. So if you want to see uh, Fargo on the big screen with uh, Stephen Park, uh, you can do it Wednesday night at the trialon cinema, and then people will be mass and socially distanced, so there's not very many tickets available. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's just about 20 after the hour. Maybe we should um, bring All right. Rupa and Am I on uh, now? Am I, on. Should yeah. I do the intro here? Yeah, let's do the intro. All right. So Larissa Cocorno is a founding member of Chalk Rep, a Los Angeles theater company. At Chalk Rep, she directed Three Sisters, Family Planning, which won an Ovation Award for Best Play in an Intimate Theater and for Director, Stray and Full Disclosure. After living in Los Angeles for decades, she and her family recently returned to Minneapolis and she played hooker number one. Melissa Peterman played hooker number two. She lives in Los Angeles, works as an actor, and is best known for her role as Barbara Jean Booker Hart on the TV show Reba. 
She also, she's also co-host of a Spotify original podcast with Reba McIntyre called Living and Learning. Hey, welcome. Thank Hi, you for joining hey. us. This is so wonderful. And I just, I've loved hearing you and Steven talk. It's just, it's, it brings you right back there. Doesn't it, Larissa? <laughs> it does. It's kind of crazy to think it's like half my life ago, but yeah, it's, that's real. It's, it's a so <laughs> back. And I, and I really feel like we should have you guys on the opposite side of the screen, right? So we could get, <laughs> there we go. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Now we're in order. Great balance to the way it was. <laughs> way it was. Yeah, exactly. That's right, right. Larissa, come on. You got to give him the nod. There we go. That's, uh, that's, that's yeah. what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Wow. You both didn't know each other before the movie? We did not. Although no. I did know and worked with Missy's now husband, which is pretty crazy. Wow. My husband, John Brady, that's right. That's right, I was working with him at the time when the movie came out. So there was, it all kind of came together when the, <laughs> the two of you guys got together. I was like, what? That was great. Yeah. Terrific. So yeah. is this the first time you guys have seen each other in 25 no. years? No, oh, no. Oh, uh -huh. good. Saw each other quite uh, fairly frequently. We have a very good, close mutual friend in Los Angeles, so she often brought us together. Oh, terrific! Okay, and we have, we have kids who are around the same age too. But, yeah, yeah. All right. We so, stick together. Hooker number one and number two. We stick together. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Once we were, once we came together, you couldn't part us. No. That's just so reassuring to me. It just makes my heart warm. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. good. Me too. Me too. So why, why don't we talk about how you guys, how each of you got the role. Um, we can start with Melissa. Melissa, tell us your, your story. Uh, well, Jane Brody was casting and I was lucky enough, she uh, came to Mankato State University, which is now Minnesota State, in my last semester as a senior to teach uh, an acting class. And so I got to know her then. And she was fantastic. And when I graduated, she was casting the movie or doing a lot of the, the I think, taking some of the casting in Minneapolis. And she brought me in and I auditioned. And I think I originally auditioned for the part that Michelle Hutchinson got. And I did this audition, uh, didn't really hear anything for quite some time. So I, you know, you sort of let it go. And then they brought me back in to read for this the other part. And I think there was a few ladies there, more than there was wasn't just Larissa and I, and they were pairing us up. And I remember when they paired Larissa and I up in the room, it kind of felt magical. And we like, well, Larissa, you can tell the story, but we they laughed and um I sort of felt like this is the match and we should be we should be hooker number one and number two. And that was sort of it. That's that was that was my story. Although and, so far, I think it was the first audition. And again, this is the beauty of being so young and naive that I would I had no idea how nervous I should be. Um and meeting the Cohen brothers. Um and again, the, the you know, I obviously knew who they were, but I didn't really um they weren't like photographed a ton. So I didn't really know exactly what they looked like. And I think it was my first audition where I asked Joel Cohen for change for the soda machine. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought maybe he worked there. I <laughs> Did he um, the change? Did he give you yeah. change? I think he really gave me change and I believe um, I got a Mountain Dew. So again, more poor choices as a young lady. Um, yes, I, I was I was very naive. All right. And Larissa, um, tell us about your you know, story before the audition or how you came to read for the role. My story was a little longer. I, I had a series of auditions. I had two, I think, with Jane Brody, then with whoever that New York casting person was. Then, then I think finally, no, then I might've gone back to Jane Brody and then I got to. Read okay. The and, and, spe and, and speaking, speaking of, of, of your Jane Brody audition, Jane Brody is, was the local casting person yes. for Fargo. Yes. And I interviewed her for the book and she, she was, yeah. she's, she's really fantastic. And you know, since I wrote the book, I, I've gotten so into trying to learn more about acting that I've actually signed up for some of her, some of her sessions. Just she's so I, could, I took a class with her after, after Fargo and I, found it to be very, she's a good teacher. Yeah, very good teacher. Yeah. She is. 
So why don't we take a look at Larissa's, one of Larissa's audition tapes. It's very short. Larissa Coconut. We need four hookers. So where are you girls from? Shasta. But I went to school in White Bear Lake. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I want you to tell me what these fellows look like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. Mm-hmm. Um, in what way? I don't know, just funny looking. Could you be more specific about him? I couldn't really say he wasn't circumcised. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. He wasn't circumcised. That's a that's a big big that's, thing there. I mean, right there. <laughs> regarding regarding that, I'm I was surprised to read that you nobody had discussed nudity with you at all. And that never came up until this nudity writer showed up in your trailer. Could you talk about that? And and maybe I think I think you know for folks who don't know much about the movie business, maybe you could also explain what a nudity nudity writer is. Yeah, <laughs> I sign one every night at home. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone back there, just just to, my husband insists on it. Yeah. Uh, a nudity writer. I I only really learned about nudity writers. Right. Before. No, really. So, if I, so it's basically something an actor has to sign that would give permission. Yeah, that would to... allow that allows them to be filmed nude, and it's basically a contract. Usually, though, it's negotiated and talked about before you take the role, <laughs> or it comes up somewhere in the process. And the thing that was so fascinating, and then Liz and I both kind of like freaked out about, is it didn't appear until after we had actually filmed the first scene, which is actually the second scene. The interview scene is the second scene in the narrative. The the, the, scene, shot. the key scene that they were having us sign the thing is was filmed later, actually like a month later whatever but the johnny carson scene yeah exactly it was, it was in the hotel room the bouncing on the beds and then uh, watching the john yes exactly yeah. Yeah. so it but it's so it's waiting for us in our trailers after we get back from filming that day and uh i think you came into my trailer and you were like did you get this and i was like yeah and I was, you said are you gonna sign it and i was like no <laughs> And she was like, really? And I was like, ah, this should not have happened at this point. If they want it, if this was really important to them, this is not when this is, this is not when you present it. And I just, I mean, I was just very like, I, I mean, God knows how I was like 25 years old, but I was like, this is just not how this should go. And I don't feel, it just feels like the wrong timing. It feels, it feels not um, honest. So when Joel came in and said, I heard, I heard we have to talk about this. I was like, yeah, I said, um, if, if this was really important to you, you should have talked about it during auditions. So I said, I don't feel comfortable. I, I said, it, I understand that it might be part of your vision, but I don't really see it. I don't see how crucial it is. I feel like that. So I didn't try and talk him out of it. I was just kind of like bad timing, you know, bad timing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it was one of you who said that it wasn't natural either anyway, right? So it would have been- I thought Missy's point- I, I said that, I mean, and you know, when they had, you know, discussed it and I, everything that, that Larissa said I agreed with, it was sort of like, this should have been something, you know, uh, brought up much earlier. And, and I did say the same thing, which is intimidating as a young woman to like say, and they were so, they were very receptive and listen. And I just said, you know, I'm a lady and I just don't think that it is, you would do that. It didn't seem natural to that moment either. Like you right. wouldn't, you wouldn't, that's not how you would watch TV, no matter what you had just done in the previous second. And I, and I didn't think that it was going to add anything to the story or the scene. And, um, and they listened and it was, I'm glad that they did, but it was nice to know that Larissa and I were on the same page about that. And um, again, Thank God, because it, you and at the same time, I don't think I was capable of making that choice at that moment. Like this is your first big job for me out of school. Like, I don't know where I I'm not saying I'll never do it, although I'm sure. But it was just sort of like in this moment, it didn't feel right for this story. It didn't feel right for the way it went down. And it wasn't right for me. And um, they were very, very kind and, and receptive to that and understood. 
And then they, then we, when we filmed that scene, which is still uncomfortable, regardless that whether it was nu nudity or not, um, it was, it felt very safe and it felt, I, I felt okay about it. Um, but again, you know, you think about, um, I, I don't even know if I was, I was literally, it was like the months after graduating college. So just young, young and it, and, um, yeah. That's how it went down. Well, and now they have intimacy directors who would be organizing all of that, right? right? Exactly, exactly. I have to tell you, one of my funniest moments in the entire process of shooting Fargo, and I, Missy and I definitely connected about this later because the scene that we filmed in the ho in the motel room uh, was so, I mean, it's so awkward. It's so sure. There's very few people in, luckily, but like you're, you know, you're, I met Steve Buscemi one time and now we're going to like be performing the sex act together. Like it's so bizarre. And I am a very modest, shy person in general. Like that's much more thing. So, and Steve, it turns out was too. So we're literally lying in the hotel bed with the cheats pulled up to our chins, right? We're just like making small talk. And I'm like, so where are you where are you from? He's like New York. Where in New York? Brooklyn? Oh, we're in Brooklyn. Park Slope. Oh, I have friends in Park Slope. So we're literally, this is what we're talking about before we shoot that scene. And that's the reality of those scenes. You're sort of like, did you have the mac and cheese at lunch? It was really good. <laughs> no, you're just making <laughs> small just lighting. Anything but what you are about to do. Just yeah. keep your focused. Anyhow. And, we did and I, have a very lovely conversation. Oh, here. great! And I love uh, how you mentioned that Joel really liked your ponytail. Totally. And, and, and that you so focus perfect. on that. Well, we only shot that scene twice, and the first time he was like, "Hey, Larissa, your 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 ponytail is doing this great thing." I was like, "Great! That's all I'm going to think about <laughs> the next day." So that's all I thought about on the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the you next remember? time the viewers oh, watch sorry. the movie, they should focus on the yeah. ponytail. Yeah, my ponytail is spinning around in circles. Yeah. I just saw it last night for the first time in a while, and I was just focusing on your ponytail. It was great. And and honestly, in the in the interview scene, it was the same thing. He they Joel came up to us, or Ethan. I don't, you know, who was it, Melissa? It was they were like, I think it was Ethan. I felt like um, I felt like um, in my experience that it, if I remember that Joel and Ethan would talk in between. <laughs> And, and Ethan would be the one to deliver uh, whatever him and Joel had talked about. So I always feel like it was Ethan who talked to us. But we were doing this thing where we were kind of nodding along in the scene. And they were like, hey, you're doing this scene where you're kind of nodding along with Francis. Can you just do that more? And we were like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. We sure, can. Yeah, can do that. So that's, I mean, so much. And that you were saying this earlier, Stephen, when you guys were talking, the thing that I really found amazing about working with them is how much they trust their actors, how much they just kind of feed off of what you're giving them. That's yeah. what that's what they build off of. It has not, they're not like, oh, we wanted something else. Can you do something else? They're like, we want what you're doing. Can you do it more? Like right. that's what, that's how they work. And it's yeah. really, you really trust them because yeah. like, Said they won't let you do something that's not going to support what they want, but they're yeah. feeding off of you. So yeah. you also feel like you are what they want. Yeah. So yeah it, it totally feels very collaborative. It feels and, very, and, and very safe too, to even try. Safe. Safe. And at the same time, Stephen, when you were talking earlier about how it all is about the writing and it's such a relief when things are specific because yeah. when it's specific, you have to work less in a way. Like I love notes that are like, no, play it like you're talking to that girl that you went to high school with who you really want to be friends with, but you hate yourself that you want to be friends with. You're like, oh, I know that note. Instead <laughs> of the note of like, just more louder. Or like, you Longer, know, yeah. so specific like that. And I think that they're writing, it comes off the page so specific. I do, I have to give a shout out though, and I'm sure it's in the book, I haven't gotten there, but um, Missy also added to the writing. She did She did a little bit of improvisation. Yes, thank lot. you for mentioning that. Yeah. Melissa, tell us, tell us about that. Just, just, she was totally brilliant. 
which again, that is all due to my um, youth and na naivete. I would never dare to improvise a, in a Coen Brothers movie when they're such geniuses. But it was the Go Bears line. And it was um, White Bear Lake Polar Bears is the team. And I just added, she said, I went to I went to White Bear Lake and I'm like, who cares? Because, you know, if you, in, if you live near the community, you'd always give your team a shout out. And um, they let me do it. And I, again, Thank God I was so young. I would never dare to do that again. But um, yeah, here's a question I didn't ask you when I interviewed you. It's like, why why was the, the height of your fist right about here versus higher or more emphatic? Because they were having a mediocre season, Todd. They were having <laughs> some little, little, you were, yeah. They didn't even make playoffs, so I wasn't gonna go that high. It was just there. Yeah. And here's a sort of serious question for you. Why do you think Joel and Ethan pair, paired you guys together? I know why, because I, I was, I mean, we were just the perfect, Melissa is, t is very naturally very funny. She's just very funny. And I, I feel like our combination, it was just like the, we were like the right ingredients together. Like I was much straighter. My whole approach was a much straighter approach. And I think they liked it, but it didn't really set off until I'm, I mean, the other hookers I read with, it didn't it didn't pop until all of a sudden that other, it was chemistry. It was like a total chemistry thing. Right. And I, I honestly, I read with a number of other hookers. <laughs> there was you. no hooker I'm as funny you. as Melissa. <laughs> flat until Missy. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's what that, that's how that's supposed to work. You just totally understood in that moment. And when they started laughing, I was like, oh, right yeah this is exactly how this is supposed to work and it didn't work before then and they got it they were they were so sweet they were like you guys are so funny and i said well you wrote it and they were like it doesn't work until you know the right like they were like until the right people come along so yeah that was when we walked up i mean that was the last audition i had that day yeah. So both met, we both laughed and we were like, if we don't get these roles, something is really off because it just so, it so completely clicked in that moment. It was really yeah. And I would, I would answer it the same way is like, I felt like the, I got better when I sat next to her and it, it, the scene just sang when I sat next to her. Terrific. And, and it was like we were old friends who were like doing this little thing on the side. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and as an audience member, it totally read that way. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Although I guess there was a, for a long time, my cousin told me there was actually a really big debate online about whether we were actually hookers. Hmm. But, the, but right. But remember we, we talked we just talked about this, that, and I wanted to check my memory, but I don't, I don't know if it was Joel or Ethan. Cause we asked that, that came up of like, is this what they do? And he said, no, I think they're probably like 17. They maybe just go to the bar and hang out, and if an opportunity arises to make a little extra cash, it's just amazing. Not, you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. We're Can gonna I, turn. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead. Stephen. I was just, I just wanted to I, ask. I just wanted to ask the impact this movie has had on your life. Uh, do you, well, I, I would say, in all honesty, I, I owe Jane Brody and Joel and Ethan a huge debt of gratitude because it wasn't long after that. Um, I did move to Los Angeles and to pursue acting. And I guarantee you that I got into a lot more rooms with a lot more casting directors because of that movie mm -hmm. and it opened doors. And it truly was the first question everybody asked me when I went into an audition was something about the movie Fargo. So for me, it was huge. And also I, I had the, I was talking to somebody the other day that this movie still makes, you know, the AFI list of the top 100 movies. So just to even be a tiny little part of that is just huge for me. It's an, it's an honor. So it was huge. It was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. To have that on your resume, a Coen Brothers movie like that was, it was huge. I mean, yeah. Steven, you had more than one, so. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, totally. And Larissa, how about you? I think the impact is really different for me um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, I, Francis and I had actually uh, a really interesting conversation the night the movie came out. Um, we were at Bryant Lake Bowl or wherever after. The Bryant Lake Bowl. 
Yes. Yeah, because yeah, the Minneapolis screening was at the uh, the Suburban yeah, World for the yes, for, for, for casting right. Crew, right? And then so, everybody went to yeah. That's right. So uh, so we were there, and we sat down at a little table. We found a little table off to the side, and Francis was like, "Hey, mm -hmm. um, uh, I just want to say, I think this movie is actually going to be a thing." And I, I just want to tell you, you know, if you if you want to do this, if you should go to LA now. And she's like, I'm totally happy to help you out in any way or whatever. And I looked at her once again, still blows my mind. But I was like, I don't think this is what I want to do. I, I was a theater person and I still wanted to be a theater person. I didn't really want to jump into film and television. And she was like, that's really cool that you know that and she was like so don't go to LA <laughs> I, was like, uh, I did end up in LA a few years later with my husband but uh, I think actually the biggest impact on me was Francis I learned <clears throat> a tremendous about my uh, a tremendous amount about myself and who I wanted to be in the world from just that brief interaction with her. I really did. I mean, what a wonderful yeah. gift that she gave you too. To, you, totally. spent, you spent a lot of time with her. I did. I did. And I actually, I mean, I go back to that conversation a lot because the impact of that conversation on my life is still there. It's totally still there. So, and she still has an impact on me now in terms of what she's doing and what she's yeah. saying. And mm. She is just a real, she is a total beacon for me in she's, the world. She so embodies authenticity, doesn't she? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, to this day, the quote that I go back to more and more, um, when I, I asked her, I said, this was early on in our conversation when we were working about on our dialect. And I said, Francis, you have already have this kind of career that people of my age, young women of my age who are acting, really admire i was like what you know what's that about what you know, what's your secret right and she said i i want to be doing this when i'm 80. so i make choices that are about longevity i don't want the quick flash in the pan i don't want to rise to start i'm too fast i want to choose roles that i can sink my teeth into and i want to be doing them when i'm 80. and i was like oh my God, that is such, I it just, it was, I just held on to it. I was like, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. If it's something you love doing, you want to be doing it forever. It's not about like how fast you can get there or what's the thing that's going to get me there, you know, the most money or the most this. It's it's like, no, I just want to keep doing it. Right. So I'm going to make choices about that. Mm -hmm. And that to me, I had never heard anybody in the business say that. So to hear her say that was really impactful for me. And I'm 26 years old. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to go to questions here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and also, yes, so please, please feel free to um, throw your questions into the little comments bar there if you're if you're watching. And of course you are if you're listening, right? <laughs> but but I wanted to ask ask all of you, because all of you had scenes with Francis. I heard a couple of people who I interviewed describe Francis as as generous as an actor. And I know Melissa talked about this specifically. Like when, when actors use the word generous when talking about another actor, what does that mean? And, and how was Francis generous? Uh, for me, it means that they want the their partner, their partner or partners in the scene to shine as well. They're the actor that is so secure in what they're doing that they're not worried about, well, why is she getting this or I want that line or whatever they want. They know at the, they know that if you look good, they look good. And the better we all look together, it just, it bodes well for the final product. And I, um, what a great lesson early on in a career to see, watch somebody who is this amazing actress and Larissa, you, you I mean, she just had a presence and was, um, phenomenal and came prepared and came to play, but she also, you could almost see her physically to me it, it manifested physically where when we were doing our thing she just did this and was like go for it girls and um and that is uh, not always the case with other actors and and it means that i in my opinion it means that they're not secure enough in what they're doing that they're always worried about what you're doing and if what you're doing looks 
bigger, shinier, better. So for me, it was just that ability to go like, I don't have to hold back. I can just do what I felt I was supposed to do in that scene. And again, it, it and that was permeated throughout the entire atmosphere where um, it felt like everyone was like, just letting you do your thing and they weren't micromanaging you in that moment. And that was lovely. And she was very generous. And I've been lucky since then to work with um, actresses and actors who are that. And you recognize it, you know it in a minute, the minute you sit down to run a scene, you know in a minute, how it's going to go. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Terrific. And Stephen, what was your experience working with Francis? Well, like Cameron? I was saying, you know, um, the, the, the camera was on her first when we were shooting the scene. And I wasn't like holding back, you know, even though the camera wasn't on me, I was fully emotionally invested. And as a another actor, uh, you know, it was very generous of her to recognize that I was uh, emotionally so in it and that she was encouraging uh, them to turn the camera on me sooner than later, which I appreciated because that kind of intensity of emotion, you know, you can't hold on to it forever. And as an actor, so it's like you wanna, you wanna strike while the iron's hot kind of thing. So um, I really appreciated that she spotted that and that she, she uh, encouraged them to, you know, turn the camera around sooner than later. So that kind of, that kind of is how um, she expresses her generosity. All right, terrific. Well, why don't we turn to some questions? And before we do that, we're just going to remind you of the title of the book. Hold it up. Check it out. <laughs> Check it out. Get Here it, it is. Good. A lot can happen in the middle of nowhere. It's an untold story of the making of Fargo. All right, let's go to audience questions. Uh, I believe we have one. Here we go. Oh. Uh, what is it like having two directors? Were there any awkward moments or tension on the set between them and their decision making? That's uh, from my friend Lynn Brennan. Hi, Lynn. Um, well, I don't have to, I mean, I, I, they're like one voice, right? I mean, it's, there is never any arguing. There is never any, like they, they were like, you know, Siamese twins, like two heads, one mind, one vision. Everything was very clear. I, I, I would agree. And I remember sometimes when, when Ethan would come up and say, um, hey girl, uh, you know, Joel would like you. And I go, how do you know that? I don't even remember you talking to him because they could just <laughs> have this moment where I felt like he knew what Joel was looking for and they didn't have to ask each other. And there's something about uh, their siblings and they have a shorthand. They don't have, they can, it felt to me like they were communicating without words at all. Yeah. There's a, very, there's, there's a little bit in the book about that from a couple very, of different people. Yeah. Very mind meldy. They're very mind meldy. You're like, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but you may just be one person who's like split right. into bodies. And right. That's exactly what Don Bick Scahill said, the office uh, production assistant. Yeah. He, he thought one of them would say like, maybe we could, and then there'd be a pause, rent it? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, we have seen them in the same room at the same time. So we do know there are two people, but it felt like there was a definite one clear vision, which is a relief too, that you know exactly that there's just, there's one vision and everyone's on board. Yeah, and I wonder if part of that, this just occurred to me, well, I wonder if part of that goes back to the writing. I mean, lots of times when they're writing teams, they they separate, like one person go does this scene and another person, you know, does this other scene and then they come back and, and edit it and, you know, work and then work forward where these guys are always in the room together, writing it out loud together all the time. I would. Have Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Larissa. Go ahead. Uh, the one thing I just because you guys both commented on this, it, um, it also it means that there's a lot less ego. You know, like I usually think of directors as having a lot of ego. You know, especially film directors. But somehow with that split and the way they worked, the energy you got was not egoy at all. Mm -hmm. It was not like this is my thing and I want you to do this. It was kind of this other. And that's the vibe it created on the set too. So everybody kind of worked in that. There was just so little ego on that set. It was really fascinating to me. If I reflect back on it, I was like, oh, that's actually really unusual. Yeah, totally that agree. Cool. So in terms of tension, tension comes out of the ego. It comes out of feeling like that's and fear. Weird. And fear that mm. someone will fear. Yeah, yeah. 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 Somebody is gonna kind of take your spotlight or whatever. And there's just none of that on there. I never found any of that on their set. 
in their actors that they worked with. The whole vibe of it was just not that. And yeah. speaking of no ego, Larissa, do you remember this? That when we were filming the scene with Francis in the, in the bar and um, Steve Buscemi came up and he was watching like some of the takes, which are like, you don't need to be here. Like you're, you don't, why are you watching? Like you're, you're a big star. And do you remember he came up to us after and said that was really funny. And for him to be that just no ego either, it was just, totally. it was yeah. amazing. Yeah, no, very generous across the board. But like I said, they created that vibe because they were like that. That was mm -hmm. that was their vibe, and then it just spread. Mm -hmm. So you learn a lot. You know, that was another reason when I said to Francis why I was like, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. I was like, I'm not sure it gets as good as this. <laughs> like, <laughs> be at like the the top. I'm not sure I want to venture out into the world of other people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I have a feeling this was pretty, pretty top notch to the experience. And that is true. If you're going to have one film credit on your resume, far was a good one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Stop at the top. Stop. All right. I guess we have, hey, I love this. The, uh, the, the little right there. Globe. Yep. There it is. That is terrific. Um, let's go to another question. This one um, from Michael. It has been said that Margie's or Margie's scene, sorry, it has been said that Margie's scene with Mike was a turning point in the movie. Or was there any discussion of that at the time? No, did not talk about the meaning of the scene. And uh, like I, like you quoted me in the book, I didn't know the significance of it until I saw Roger Ebert and uh, Martin Scorsese talking about it, uh, that scene and how it was the catalyst for her to go back to uh, Jerry and investigate him again uh, after the phone call about realizing that I was lying to her. So yeah. <laughs> that's when it all came together for me. Yeah, yeah. And your lies are big lies too. I mean, yeah. you weren't married to Linda Cooksey; you were stalking her. And yeah. you, and if you were in the Eden Prairie School District, it was in your mom's house in the basement. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, it's fascinating though when you watch the movie, you can see all those gears turning in her. Like you can see those moments of like, oh, oh. So whether anybody knew that was gonna happen, that is definitely what that scene brought forth. And, right. really kind of and yeah, and also like, you know, the other thing that I, I really liked about both of both of the scenes that, that we've talked about for much of the hour was just like how much Minnesota there is in them. Yeah, um, so we were getting some plot or I guess, Maybe in the hookers thing, almost no plot. <laughs> <laughs> Except that the guys were funny looking. They were funny looking. <laughs> but we're getting a lot of Minnesota isms. But you know, you think of like the Mr. Mora scene, you know, the guy with the, the broom and shoveling his driveway. Yeah. Like there's like nothing as far as plot goes, but you, you just get this wonderful atmosphere of what it's what it's like. Yeah. I love that in the book you mentioned he had an issue that he was holding a broom instead of a shovel. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Bane Bilkey did not like that at all. Yeah. That Bain. scene is still one of my favorite moments in that scene too. And I, I probably didn't push the plot with me. It just was, he's so, he was so brilliant in that scene. <laughs> yeah. He was fantastic. All right. I think we have uh, more questions uh, from Chris Steller. Was there ever a question of too much regional accent? Uh, did you have to pull it back uh, on any specific lines? Just the opposite for me. Like it always felt really weird when I was doing it. And she's like, Liz Himmelstein was like, no, more, more. Oh, you know, like really lean into the vowel sounds. And yeah, she was totally pushing me more than I would naturally go myself. You know, the, like in the audition, I was really just touching on the accent from what I heard of it and uh, making it more pronounced just felt, it felt weird, but she was totally having me do it. So it was like, getting used to feeling weird, you know, as I'm speaking, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean that, yeah, she, it was totally the opposite. It was totally pushing, pushing the, the dialect. Yeah. And, and for those of you who haven't read the, read the book of uh, Liz Himmelstein was uh, the dialect coach. And so she worked with most or all of the, the non Minnesota actors. Cause I'm guessing if I remember correctly, she didn't work with, with uh, you guys. Right. She was she was in the room when Francis and I had that long conversation where we worked on the dialect. Right, right. So she was there and she asked some questions and she, she, yeah, she pressed at some of the things I was saying to get more clarification on them. But 
but uh, mm-hmm. but no, she was not. She in that moment they were they were using me. Yeah, right. And so I think yeah, for those of yeah, so what what Larissa is is, is referring to is how um, the dialect coach asked Larissa to come to Francis McDormand's hotel room at the Marquette to sort of just spend a couple of hours, have some salads, and then Larissa would speak in the Minnesota dialect. For the entire two or three hours. Where is your dialect, Larissa? It was four hours. It was, it was four, four hours? hours. Yeah, okay. we ended up talking for four hours. It's like one to five in the afternoon. <laughs> I think it was much longer than anybody expected it to be, but we had a really deep conversation. But I was doing the whole thing in the Minnesota accent the entire time I was talking like this. So I was talking about really serious things, you know, and saying how much I felt strongly about theater and stuff. But I was talking the entire time. Sorry, that's my dog. (laughs) That's okay. There it came out right there. That's my dog. (laughs) That's my dog. yeah, Yeah, I talked like that for four hours straight. But I don't have that naturally. But I heard a lot of people talk like that when I was growing up. So, All right. oh, you didn't grow up with that dialect, or did I you? I grew up around it. I didn't speak she, like that. She's oh. a sophisticated city person. She didn't. I'm I'm that. urbane, Stephen. <laughs> I was a city, but I did say this because it actually pertains to Bain Belke when they said, "Why is so? You don't have this accent naturally." In my audition, they asked me this, and I said, "They said." So how is your accent so good? And I said, oh, you know, I went to school with Bain Belke and John Donahue, because that's how they all talked. Everybody at Children's Theater talked like that. I thought that was the theater dialect, like many <laughs> the British dialect. For me, it was minute, it was these long O's and oh God, you know. Gosh, for crying out loud. For yeah. crying out loud, gosh. All right. Why don't we see if we can get another question or two in from the audience? Here we go, uh, from Nancy. Ever been to Fargo, North Dakota? <laughs> <laughs> Movie is I a huge have. favorite here. I have. <laughs> I have. All right. Four and yeses. I, just, I yeah. just drove through it again this summer. Yeah. It's yeah. a really cute town. It is. I'd love to it be is. back. I'd love to go back and see the is the wood chipper, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's right there at the uh in the grain silo right by the highway. Yeah. And don't forget to see a wood chip march. Go to the I, Fargo I, movie theater. Of yeah. course. Amazing. Yeah. Got to get back there. Got to get back. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm sure. I'm sure we have lots of questions. Oh, here we go. Patrick Marks. Fargo was wildly popular in Paris. Uh, conjecture how? Why you thought it resonated with French and other European audiences? The vibe? Question mark. By the way, I grew up near Fargo, and up the road from <laughs> from Brainerd. Fantastic. All right. Why do you think Fargo travels so well? Like, what is it about about the movie? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I can tell you I was traveling in Europe the summer after it came out and I was I was in the Czech Republic. I was in Prague for God's sake and people were like, you were in Fargo? And I was like, <laughs> what, is ha- what is happening here? Yeah, so it definitely traveled. I, I don't, I think the specificity, I think it, it's the specificity. So I think for foreign audiences, there was something so not kind of generic. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. wasn't kind of like iced over in the way I think they're used to so many Hollywood movies, kind of sounding the same. There was some there was some specificity to it that they recognized. Part of their film culture is about specificity. Yeah, right and location, but it's not so much about ours in the same way it wasn't. And so I think the movie just really hit, they were like, oh, you do have specific sounding people in your country. You just don't really put them in your movies most of the time. Right, right. The only thing flat about Fargo was the landscape. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Yeah, right. All right, maybe we can squeeze in one more here uh, if we have another one. One more question. Oh, here we go from Craig. Any stories about Peter Stormare? I have one. All right. I remember it was like after uh, shooting, we were in the hotel at night, and it was I was sitting with uh, the Cohen brothers and Peter, and we were in the lobby having drinks, and he was saying that um, he had been lighting candles in his hotel room, and it set off the fire alarm, and the fire trucks came, <laughs> and I thought that. 
That sounds like, <laughs> like like he was surprised by that, or that's just what happened. No, I mean he just he, he he had such a kind of like this lackadaisical attitude. Like he was just so, you know, kind of like his character in a way. You know, just like he just <laughs> does his own thing. You know, so I just was kind of like fantasizing about what his uh, hotel room looked like. You know, candles <laughs> right. and incense and right. Yeah, I enjoyed learning about his backstory before Fargo. I mean, I, I didn't realize that he was part of the, the Swedish National Theater, that he'd worked with Ingmar Bergman, and that yeah, he was a very famous like, like Hamlet he did at Dam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that he'd also was was in a play with uh, with Francis McDormand um, mm -hmm. at the the Public, I believe. Right. Yeah, the Swan. Yeah, the Elizabeth Egloff uh, yeah, play the Swan, and he of course played the sort of mute, half human, half Swan character, which, <laughs> you know, is not that much of a stretch from the character you played in Fargo. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Is any, any final thoughts or anything else uh, you'd like to share? Oh, my. Well, that this was so lovely, Todd. And congrats on this book. And, um, you know, I hope people, I mean, I love that people still are watching the movie and, and loving it. And that's all I got. It was lovely. And Larissa will always have hooker number one and number two. Yeah. That's and I've always been so curious about the Coen brothers process. And when you described how they don't even know what the next scene is when they're writing a scene was so illuminating to me. Um, I, I love the, the fact that they work great. that way. The book, yeah, is, the book great. is great. It'll definitely take you on a kind of new and interesting ride with the movie. If you love the movie, the book will take you to new new adventures. With the all right. So many interesting stories. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you all again. And thanks. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, I feel like there ought to be some final thought. Like what was like, I suppose we should say two more months, maybe two more months. Yeah. <laughs> no, perfect, Todd. You just have to let it be. Just let okay, it be. you're right. I'm not an actor. I'll just try to try to go like this. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Todd. Bye, Larissa. Pleasure. Thank you. Right. It's so Bye. great to meet you guys. All right. Good to great see to you all again. You. All right, bye.